we are considering two important measures. The first bill we're considering today is S-1942, the National Heritage Area Act, which would establish a National Heritage Area System to standardize the process for studying and establishing new National Heritage Areas, address concerns regarding accountability by creating an evaluation process for existing National Heritage Areas, and end the current system of piecemeal reauthorizations, providing for a single reauthorization of appropriations for 15 years. Since the first National Heritage Area was signed into law by President Ronald Reagan in 1984, Congress has established 54 additional areas to commemorate and preserve important natural, cultural, and historic resources. The bill passed the Senate by unanimous consent on December 20th. A House Companion sponsored by Representative Tonko passed as a bipartisan amendment to H.R. 803 on February 26, 2021. And um, I, I don't know. Uh, why we, we're not doing this on suspension, but uh, I, th I don't think I think people are not sure, um, and this is an important piece of legislation that we need to get done, and, um, and we're running out of time. Uh, the second bill is HR 9640, the Presidential Tax Filing and Audit Transparency Act of 2022. For almost four years, the Committee on Ways and Means has been investigating how the Internal Revenue Service enforces tax laws against and ensures compliance by. President and Vice President of the United States. In 1977, in the aftermath of President Nixon's Watergate scandal, the IRS formalized procedures for mandatory audits for the President and Vice President to ensure public confidence that America's tax laws are applied evenly and justly. But Chairman Neal's investigation found that this program, not codified in federal law, had gone dormant under the previous administration, and in fact, a mandatory audit was not initiated until two years into the former President's term. So here's the deal. This is not about a Republican president or a Democratic president. This is about the principle that no person in America is above the law. Uh, the bill we are considering today, H.R. 9640, codifies into law this mandatory audit program to give the American people um, the faith that there is one set of rules regardless of position of power. So I urge my colleagues to support both these important bills. And with that, I yield to my good friend, Mr. Cole, for any remarks he wishes to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to say I'm not surprised that we're here in the death throes of a Democratic majority, which continues to be obsessed with the former president. Both of these bills are a complete waste of this committee's time, in my view. S-1942 is a bill that the Senate passed by unanimous consent and will likely pass with broad bipartisan support, and H.R. 9640 will never become law. I'm a co-sponsor of the House-related measure to S-1942, and while I look forward to supporting this measure on the floor, I also look forward to, to hearing from our witnesses today on this important matter. Our second item is H.R. 9640, the Presidential Tax Filing and Audit Transparency Act of 2022. As I understand this measure, this bill would require the IRS to examine and make public reports on income tax returns filed by Presidents of the United States, along with those of any trusts or companies controlled by that individual or his or her spouse. It's also, it also requires the IRS to make public all presidential income tax returns. I say, as I understand, because frankly, Mr. Chairman, there hasn't been any time at all to understand what's going on here. To say this process is bad is an understatement. This process stinks. The ink isn't even dry on this bill which was introduced just today. No markup has been held, no discussion, no nothing. And once again, the majority is rushing a bill drafted behind closed doors straight to the Rules Committee without even pretending to go through regular order. What's worse, I'm told by my colleagues on the Ways and Means Committee that during the executive session yesterday that was intended to review the tax returns of a former president, Republican members of the committee were told that this bill was just a discussion draft that would be attached to the committee report. Further, they were told that they could not offer amendments to it until the majority changed their minds in the last 10 minutes of the executive session, giving no Republican members the opportunity uh, to amend this bill. Such a bait and switch is beyond the pale and not befitting the dignity of the House of Representatives. What's more, they're doing all of this on a deeply sensitive topic. Tax returns are inherently sensitive documents that contain personal information. Requiring the IRS to publicly disclose someone's tax returns, even those of the President of the United States, is a very dangerous road to go down, 
one that deserves better and longer consideration than what we're doing here today. Of course, we all know why the majority is pushing this bill at the last minute. It's an attempt to score political points off of the refusal of a former president to disclose his tax returns, as he had the right to do. It's also an attempt to provide a fig leaf of justification for their long, quixotic process uh, of trying to get those same returns from the IRS, which requires them to have a legitimate legislative purpose for doing so. It is frankly a sad attempt at justifying their long obsession on this matter. This is clearly not what we should be doing today, Mr. Chairman, not with the government funding expiring on Friday, not with an ongoing crisis at the southern border, not with inflation crushing American workers, and not with Russia and China's ongoing push to dominate the Eastern Hemisphere. We can and should do better. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Well, thank you. And, and, and when we get to the Ways and Means uh, matter, we'll have more discussion on that. But let me just say, I, as I said at the beginning, I, I'm, it's shocking to me that we need to meet in the Rules Committee on uh, S-1942 um, because, again, it passed by unanimous consent in the United States Senate. But my understanding is uh, that we can't get an assurance that, in fact, uh, the votes will be there to pass it under suspension. And what would be a waste of time is for us to bring the bill to the floor under suspension, have it fail, and then have to come back to the Rules Committee and do this all over again. Uh, again, I don't know why some of these things are so difficult, but, uh, you know, they seem to... They seem to be. Um, and with that, um, I, am, I want to welcome uh, the Honorable Paul Tonko and the Honorable Bruce Westerman uh, uh, from the Committee on Natural Resources uh, for being here to testify on S 1942. And I would yield now to Mr. Tonko for his opening remarks. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, I thank you and Ranking Member Cole for the opportunity to address the committee regarding S-1942, the National Heritage Area Act. There are currently 55 National Heritage Areas in active operation in communities across our great country. Sites, cultural, historical, or natural significance to help tell our unique, diverse American story. In New York's 20th Congressional District, uh, for example, these legendary sites include the Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor, and the Maurice D. Hinchy, a former colleague, our late, whose name uh, is uh, uh, the banner of the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Corridor. For decades, these sites have opened wide the doors of economic opportunity and community engagement for constituents in my district and beyond. Across our country, heritage areas touch 34 states and nearly 600 counties. They create local jobs, they boost local economies, and bind communities together in every corner of America. In total, America, it's the heritage areas have a nearly $13 billion annual economic impact and support some 150,000 jobs nationwide. They also return an average $5.50 for every were appropriated by effectively leveraging public and private partnerships in the communities that they serve. Despite broad bipartisan support and continued interest from communities across the country, these sites have faced inconsistent treatment before Congress. There is no standardized programmatic system uh, of administration for heritage areas, which has required each area to pursue digital funding extensions and reauthorization as a congressional action. Even in this year's omnibus agreement, several sites required extensions. This stopgap model puts a burden on local coordinating entities. The Bipartisan National Heritage Area Act, and most importantly, predictability for them to continue to serve their communities and strengthen surrounding economies with minimal federal support. The National Heritage Area Act would and the current system of piecemeal reauthorizations to a 15-year authorization for all existing areas. It would establish the first ever standardized criteria for designating new heritage areas, include a number of new study authorizations and designations, most of which 
have already passed the House on suspension, and it would finally ensure that private property rights are never affected by heritage area activities. 45 of the 55 areas are scheduled to expire during the 118th Congress, including more than 30 throughout next year. The Senate has already acted to preserve these cherished sites by passing S-1942 by unanimous consent. It is now time for the House to act. H.R. 1316, uh, which I introduced in the House, has some 137 bipartisan co-sponsors and passed the House this Congress as part of H.R. 803, the protecting in the wall. Up on the bill, which passed on suspension with 221 co sponsors. National heritage areas are an incredibly popular, bipartisan way of preserving American history and culture while supporting local economies. Congress now has the opportunity to ensure these sites can be enjoyed for generations to come by finally making our National Heritage Act law. So I therefore urge the committee to report a rule that allows for the consideration of the Senate passed bill. And I again thank you for allowing me to appear before the committee virtually. I'm happy to answer any questions. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Westerman. Thank you, Chair McGovern and Ranking Member Cole. And I know there's questions about why are we here? Why is this bill before us? And I guess my answer to that would be because the only thing that's certain about this place right now is uncertainty. Um, I actually agreed to let this bill go on suspension, but I was told that the majority decided it needed to go on a rule because you didn't think it had enough votes for um, to pass on suspension. I can't guarantee how all Republicans are going to vote on a bill that was passed out of the Senate last night and, and given to us today. So um, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement about the bill or the importance of it. Um, it is undoubtedly important to many congressional districts across the nation. It's important to many of you sitting here today. And I'm supporting the bill. Uh, but I would like to talk about how the process is broken and how it, it really, really needs to change. You know, we've come to a point in Congress where we shove everything off until the last minute, and members on both sides of the Capitol scramble during the month of December to attach whatever they can to Christmas tree legislation. Bills are passed at the last minute without even having a hearing in committee, and bills like the one before us today get shoved at us by the Senate without the House having an equal opportunity to give input. Uh, this is not what the American people deserve. They deserve legislation that has been vetted. They deserve legislation that has been uh, through the committees of jurisdiction, and they deserve legislation that has been equally considered in both chambers. Uh, I will say there's a bright spot about this bill being in rules today, and that is that it's not being shoved into the omnibus, uh, like so many other things have been shoved into the omnibus. Uh, I, I wish that we could, um, you know, have a, a much more vetted process on a lot of the other authorizing bills in the omnibus. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I want to take a positive away from this piece of legislation, it's the fact that it's not in the omnibus and it's going through some semblance of regular order. Uh, during the during end of year negotiations, Republicans came to the table in good faith. We offered several compromises to our Democratic counterparts, such as shortening the reauthorization of national heritage areas from 15 to seven years. Instead of continuing to work with us into the next Congress, the Senate has instead chosen to ram this bill through the House in the final days of session. We even allowed a short-term one-year NHA reauthorization to ride in the omnibus package so that we could avoid this situation. We gave this the green light so that we could give NHA certainty and continuity for another year while we worked in a bipartisan and bicameral manner to fix the problem. Instead, we're now spending the final days of this session rushing to finish this legislation that, again, has not been fully vetted. I know there are many members on both sides of the aisle that deeply care about uh, national historic areas, but regular order exists so that issues of national importance such as this can be handled appropriately without any unintended consequences. The truth of the matter is we do not know if this legislation will have unintended consequences on existing NHAs. We do not know if the new standards put forth in this legislation will make it more difficult to pass future NHAs. 
not knowing should be unacceptable to us. But because our process is broken, this is where we find ourselves, and we will find ourselves here again unless something changes. While I support this legislation today, I want to be clear that when I'm uh, afforded the opportunity to take over the Natural Resources Committee chairmanship next year, that the process will be different. We will hold hearings and markups uh, on legislation, and if any member on the House or the Senate uh, thinks they will be able to sneak legislation past us in the dead of night on the final days of session, uh, they will be in for a rude awakening. Uh, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, and I'm not going to defend the Senate, um, uh, but I am. Uh, but I think what I'm hearing is that, in spite of the preamble to getting to talking about this underlying legislation, that there, there seems to be bipartisan support. I, I just wish the comfort level was enough that we could just do it under suspension. But here we are in the Rules Committee, and we'll get it done. And um, I mean, I think. There are a number of members, Democrats and Republicans, who care deeply about these issues, and uh, want to see them. Uh, they want to see this bill passed, and um, and uh, so uh, I appreciate uh, both of you being here. And uh, I yield to the gentleman from Oklahoma. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to quickly associate with my uh, myself with my good friend uh, from Arkansas's remarks about the process. It, uh, I, I think the legislation is fine, and I, I fully intend to vote. Uh, for the legislation. As I said, I co-sponsored something very similar to it, the House version, and uh, we'll look at it, do our due diligence, but uh, I can understand why people are a little bit concerned about stuff being thrown at them at the last minute, not moving through committee, <clears throat> because we're getting a lot of that this week, and uh, we've gotten a lot of it in recent weeks. So uh, while I regret that, it certainly won't prevent me from supporting the legislation in question, uh, but uh, again, I'm not going to be critical for anybody else looking at it and say, anybody looked at this? Anybody really made sure? Because I think those are legitimate points that my friend from Arkansas made. So with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, while I support the bill, I uh, uh, I think you're wise not to defend the Senate. Uh, I associate myself with you on that. No sense trying to defend the indefensible. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that creates a lot of the problems that we're seeing over here. People just have the sense that they're getting the bums rush from the United States Senate. And I say that not in a partisan sense. I say that in an institutional sense. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this another day, but I, I will make the point, and I make this in defense of the House. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved every appropriations bill out of full committee uh, two years in a row. The Senate hasn't moved any appropriations bill. Out of, uh, out of the Appropriations Committee on their side in two years. Uh, we, we moved about half of those bills across the floor. Uh, and I think we could have moved the other half. It would have taken some give and take. Uh, and uh, my friends decided not to do that. That's, that's their call. I understand those are tough. But there was some semblance of order over here in dealing with that. There's been none on the other side. But again, that's a discussion for another day in the not too distant future. So. With that, uh, I want to thank uh, both our witnesses for being here. I want to thank them both for working on the bill on our side and, uh, and I think doing so in good faith. And I think uh, hopefully uh, the product that we're going to vote on will actually reflect the good work that both of them did in this area. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Torres. I, I, I'm not to, here to defend the Senate, but I, I just want to say that, you know, there are 50-50 split Senate and for me, I can totally see why they have not been able to move a whole lot of legislation forward. We look forward to next year having a one-member majority. Uh, maybe they'll do better and, uh, um, you know, meet our standards. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fishbach. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Raskin. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank uh, Mr. Tonko for his hard work on this excellent legislation, and I know that's going to benefit a lot of people in Maryland with the creation of a new Southern Maryland heritage uh, area. Um, and so I'm grateful to you for your hard work on it. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I, I should thank Mr. Tonko, too, because he's the he represents my sister-in-law um, in upstate New York, so uh, she'd want me to say thank you. Um, uh, uh, anybody on the Democratic side, anybody want to add in? Mr. Raleigh? 
No, only to uh, thank my dear friend Paul Tonko for his uh, many years of leadership, and I'm grateful to see him, and I look forward to uh, voting on this bill. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Desaigne? Okay. No, thank you, Paul Tonko. Okay. Uh, Ms. Ross? No, all good. Okay. Uh, terrific. That's it. No other, anybody other have any questions? This is like the shortest time you've been here. Um, uh, no other questions? You're free to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Ranking Member. Uh, so this closes the hearing on S-1942. So uh, I'd like to welcome our witnesses to provide testimony in H.R. 9460, Presidential Tax Filing and Audit Transparency Act of 2022, uh, Representative Chu and Representative uh, Smith. Um, We're delighted that you are here. I now recognize the gentleman from California, uh, Representative Chu, for opening statement. Justly to all, regardless of power or position. At the start of the 116th Congress, the House Committee on Ways and Means began a review of the IRS's mandatory presidential audit program, an internal policy that examines the President's returns without exception. The committee sought to investigate how the IRS's mandatory audit program operated under the stress of a president who maintained financial interests in hundreds of related entities and reportedly was under audit every single year. After four years of litigation ending at the Supreme Court, the committee received access to the necessary files and tax returns at the end of November. The committee's investigation revealed only one mandatory audit was started under the prior administration and the program was otherwise dormant at best. The examination of the 2017 to 2019 returns was not even started until the president left office, and none of the audits were ever completed. The committee's findings show a clear need for Congress to act. The Presidential Tax Filings and Audit Transparency Act would ensure the integrity of the IRS audit program enable IRS employees to fully audit all issues and restore confidence in the federal tax system. The act requires on a going forward basis that the secretary examines each presidential income tax return as rapidly as possible and regularly provide public reports on the status of the examination. It also requires the secretary to disclose and make publicly available each presidential income tax return each IRS report regarding the examinations and any audit material while protecting key identity information. Like every other American, the president is obligated to pay taxes owed. This is a core responsibility of our common citizenship. Without tax revenue, our government would cease to exist. Auditing the income taxes of the president is unlike auditing the income taxes of any other American. No one else has the power to sign bills into law, nor do they have the power to personally direct every department, agency, bureau, and office of the vast executive branch of the government. And no other American has the comparable power to appoint or terminate officials responsible for decisions that could affect the president's personal financial prospects. Our revenue system, and hence our democracy, hinges on public faith, that our tax laws are administered fairly and without favor. I urge my colleagues to send the Presidential Tax Filings and Audit Transparency Act to the House floor as quickly as possible to ensure this public faith is restored and upheld. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday, Ways and Means Democrats took an unprecedented step to to vote to make public private tax returns. 
They unleashed a dangerous new political weapon that reaches far beyond any sitting or former president and jeopardizes the privacy of every American. To be clear, our concern is not whether President Trump should release his tax returns, as has been tradition, or whether his returns are even accurate. That's up to the IRS as well as the taxpayer. Republican opposition to this unprecedented action is focused on protecting the privacy of American taxpayers from a Congress that can now, with the flimsiest of reasons, target political enemies to harass, embarrass, and even destroy by making their private tax returns public. This targeting is not limited to elected or public officials, but can target private citizens, business and labor leaders, and even Supreme Court justices. No party, no individuals in Congress should have that power. We have been warning House Democrats for the past four years in their rush to target a former president not to unleash this dangerous new political weapon on the American people. With yesterday's vote, the political enemies list is back in, in Washington, D.C. We've seen what happens when private tax information supplied by the IRS is used for political advantage, and it was the grounds for articles of impeachment against President Nixon. That is the basis of the Watergate reforms that continued until today to protect the privacy of American taxpayers, to ensure that private tax information is not used as a political weapon. We got a glimpse of what abuse of power looks like when the committee revealed and the IRS admitted how the agency targeted Americans based on their political beliefs. Lois Lerner apologized and resigned in disgrace for it. Democrats recently argued before the courts that they seek to improve the presidential audit program. But no congressional hearings were held, no member briefings occurred. No serious efforts were taken. Just a rushed, cursory glimpse targeting only one of many former presidents and vice presidents who returns, whose returns have been audited, or we hope have. And to improve an internal IRS program, and to improve an internal IRS program, the solution is to make confidential tax information public? No, it's clear what this was, and it was a targeting of a political opponent. This is a dangerous precedent precisely because it reverses Congress's post-Watergate taxpayer protections and provides a new path to weaponize the tax code against political rivals or critics. If Democrat colleagues were serious about conducting real presidential audit oversight rather than targeting a specific taxpayer, there is clear precedent for a measured approach that preserves taxpayer privacy for everyone. Refer the matter to experts at the Joint Committee on Taxation an independent organization with expertise in these matters. Task them with reviewing the documents, comparing this presidential audit against other similar audits and the IRS rules directing the reviews. They can then report back to the committee and would have more than a mere 11 days to do so. Public statements by Democrats in Congress and on this committee have made clear the desire of Democrats to make pr private taxpayer returns public simply for the sake of political gain. This has always been the purpose and goal of the Democrats who have, who have been so adamant about this. Yesterday's vote to make private tax information public is a regrettable stain on this committee and on Congress and will simply make our politics more divisive and disheartening. In the long run, I think even Democrats will come to regret, regret this and perhaps sooner than one might think. This brings me to the legislation we are considering today. If Democrats truly just wanted to revise the presidential audit program, then they should have done exactly that. But they had four years to do so, and they didn't need private tax returns to accomplish this goal. We may have been open to such an idea. The Democrats, however, have turned this into a partisan exercise to give themselves cover for releasing President Trump's tax returns. Plain and simple, the process was rushed. We never marked this up in committee, and there are serious flaws in this legislation that could have and should have been addressed before putting it to a vote on the floor. The bill was only introduced a few hours ago. Democrats should bring this back after it has been vetted and gone through regular order and after working to find common ground on a bipartisan approach. Until that time, there is no way Republicans can support this bill. Well, thank you very much. Um, and you know, when, when the Republicans take over the House, they can introduce a bill um, mandating that uh, Joe Biden release his taxes, but then he has. Um, and so has every president uh, since Nixon, other than, uh, other than Trump. Um, and in fact, Trump said, if I remember correctly, during the campaign that he couldn't release his taxes because he was being audited. Ms. Chu, did, did the, the, the investigation that the Ways and Means Committee do uh, conclude that Trump's 
was being audited uh, when he said he was being audited? He was being audited, but there is nothing that prevents a revelation of one's tax returns if you are audited. Right. So uh, it was not, not necessary uh, for him to uh, have that excuse right. in order to reveal his taxes. And, and if I, I mean, this bill is not about what Ways and Means did with regard to Trump's tax returns. This is about, I mean, I think, I think everybody assumed that there were mandatory audits going on. Um, I mean, I, I think, I think every, I mean, didn't you? I mean, are, are, the, the, are, the mandatory audits yeah. are from the handbook or the manual at the we're, IRS. It's not in statute. No, I know, but I, I just assumed they were doing them. I mean, I, I mean, I think most people thought that that was happening on a regular basis. I mean, I, I think what was revelatory about uh, what, what came out of the uh, uh, Ways and Means Committee yesterday was that it wasn't. I mean, I, I think, and I think the point of the matter is, people. I think most people think that that's a good thing. I mean, the president. We're, we're all worried about conflicts of interest. Everybody. I think everybody wants to make sure that the president of the United States, whoever he or she, hopefully someday will be, it, it may be. Um, you know, is not doing things to enhance their own wealth or, you know, their family's wealth. I mean, I, th I think there's a, I think people, I, I just think people just assume that this was happening. I was surprised that it wasn't happening. Ms. Chu? There, there is a reason that this bill is coming relatively late in this Congress, and that is we did not get the tax returns until November. And so it was not until then that we saw that there wasn't a mandatory presidential audit being done and so clearly there has to be uh, a federal mandate for this to take place. That is what this bill is all about. Yep, Mr. Smith. Releasing private information, or even discovering it in this case, is not necessary to reform an audit process that uh, some folks have concerns about, and, and I think and, there could be bipartisan right. concern as well. And, it, and, and we can debate whether that was the, whether or not uh, about about that, but I mean, but this bill is not about whether to release, you know, Donald Trump's taxes. This bill is about making sure that we have a process in place that I think most people thought was in place already. But in any event, I mean, well, well the, the JCT Joint Committee on right. Taxation had 11 days. Oh. There's some things you can determine in, in 11 days, but not everything. But certainly, uh, the the they were not even wanting to rush to a conclusion given uh, the fact that uh, audits are currently underway. Yeah, I would just say, you know, when I think of the president, the president is not just some ordinary person. Uh, you know, the president, uh, again, is, uh, is the leader of the free world. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the idea that somehow the American people should not be able to have access to the president's taxes and to know his financial situation, that somehow that's like a radical invasion of pri I mean, don't run for president if you don't want people looking into your, uh, into your finances. Uh, but the bottom line is I think, that, you know, every other president has released their taxes. I mean, except this one. And, and but you know what, but this isn't even about- But not about in the same manner. Yeah. I, I need but, yeah, but, th but this, even, this isn't even about him at this point. I mean, he's gone and hopefully we will never see him again. Uh, this is about, you know, what happens from this day forward. And, uh, you know, and whether this bill becomes law or not, my, ex my hope is that, uh, you know, that uh, we will continue to work on this until it does become law. Uh, or because I, th I think that I think I don't think this is unreasonable. I, th I think I think these audits are important. But anyway, well, the, the, yeah. the concerns about the IRS, you know, I, I think uh, can be well founded. I'm, I'm concerned that they release all these documents with private identifying personal information and, and refused, when asked, refused to redact that. Now, I, I have concerns about that, but at bare minimum, the IRS is currently undergoing the, uh, undertaking the audits uh, as, as required or uh, specified, and I don't think we should interrupt that, uh, certainly with, with what is being yeah. proposed. I, 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 here's the deal. If you don't want your taxes released, don't run for president. Um, you know, that should be... You know, I, I don't think that that's a, a you know, um, you know, uh, we can all, all argue over the process, but uh, the American people deserve to know. Uh, and that's what the, I, that's the way I look at this. But I appreciate your perspective, and it's always great to see you. And thank you, uh, Ms. Chu. Mr. Cole. Well, thank you very much. Uh, just to respond quickly to your point, 
say that about a speaker. You could say that about the majority leader in the United States Senate. Uh, you know, I don't know where you stop on this, but uh, there's certainly lots of people that have great amount of power that you could do this to. But to this particular piece, uh, Mr. Smith, I really just have one basic question for you today. Would you describe, and you did some of this in your uh, remarks, but I would ask you to describe the process you went through on consideration of the discussion draft of the bill, H.R. 9640, as introduced today. What kind of process did we have leading into this legislation coming before us here today? Pretty much nothing. I mean, it was it was brought up uh, just <laughs> moments ago, and certainly I, I think something like this could, could be a, a unifying effort uh, to put to rest some division and, and lack of unity across our country by focusing on very legitimately a process uh, of disclosure, perhaps. Uh, but this is late in the game, as was even... Uh, pointed out here, I, I think it, it, it's inappropriate without the proper vetting or, or hearings and markups. Um, as we, we did not mark up the bill yesterday, let, let me be very clear. We marked up this process uh, for the uh, release of the private information. So we've had no hearing on the bill? No hearing. We've had no markup on the bill? No markup. Uh, any member have an opportunity to present amendments to the bill? Absolutely not. I think that tells us all we need to know about what the real aim here. This is not a serious piece of legislation. It's not going to become law. Everybody here knows that. The United States Senate is not going to pick it up and move it. I mean, it's, it's just an effort to score political points at the very end here, and I regret that. And, and, and to, to emphasize the fact that the cries for at least four years for the release, and, and even more than that, for the release of the private information, those were loud and they were frequent. They mentioned nothing about the legislative purpose. This so-called legislative purpose, this bill here today, is only more recent in, in its uh, approach to, to uh, kind of conjure up the, the so-called uh, legislative purpose. I mean, recent is a generous word. Recent could be a week ago, a month ago. This is like today. And, and even throughout and this yes. process on, on the returns, I mean, the... There was not a level playing field in terms of both parties uh, having the same access, and uh, it, it's unfortunate because I, I think this is dangerous and a horrible, horrible precedent. I think you've made my point. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Before I yield to Mr. Story, do, do, Mr. Story, do, you, do you think a president has an obligation to release his or her taxes to the American people? Do you think that's a, something that should be expected or required? Well, I think that financial disclosures uh, that you and I both complete and, and all members a House and Senate, I, I think that's a reasonable way to So you, you, don't, you, you think a financial disclosure is means that you don't have to, that the president shouldn't release his taxes? Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I don't think... I mean, every, I mean, every president has I'm, uh, since Nixon, so I'm just trying to figure out, like, and they also do financial disclosures as well. So the, I, I guess, so, so you're of the opinion that what President Trump, how he handled this was, was just, was fine. I'm not here to evaluate that. I'm here to say that private information released against the wishes of the taxpayer is inappropriate. Okay, all right. Uh, Mrs. Torres. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin by saying that I fully support um, this uh, bill, and thank you, um, uh, Congresswoman Chu, for bringing it before us, and thank you also, um, Ranking Member, for being here. Um, the internal, um, the IRS last year when, or this year earlier, when we were um, looking at funding for the IRS, um, I know that we, you know, looked at um, different audits that they should have been doing that they were not doing uh, because of lack of personnel. Um, under the Republican rule, they had been um, stripped of um, any gains in um, <laughs> being able to uh, hire personnel in order to fully um, do the work that they are expected um, to do. So while, um, while the IRS policy, um, I guess it is in their manual to um, conduct these presidential audits, they only did one. And that was still during the time that the former president, it was also discovered 
apparently, that the former president was directing that some um, people who he perceived to be his enemies um, be audited. Um, so what we are trying to do here is take a current policy that is in the IRS manual, which I assume is you know very um, big. Um, we're taking that from a policy into statutory requirement. Is that correct? That is correct. OK. And what will, is the benefit between um, having a written policy on a manual that could be ignored versus statutory uh, requirement? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, we put the weight of the federal government into this mandate. And if it is the law of the land, then there is greater urgency with which to complete this task. Also, we actually provide for um, greater timelines and specificity in terms of what they have to do in the audits, uh, whereas uh, it is somewhat um, ambiguous in the, in the manual itself. So it is very, very important to shore this, this program up with this bill? Um, because today they have been focused on um, auditing, you know, the poor working class, middle income families, and uh, really failing to do the bulk of the tax cheats as we see them um, for reasons that they did not have the personnel, that did not have the expertise, they did not have the experience um, in order to face off with um, Wall Street type of law firms um, and IRS uh, consultants, um, you know, that have all the expertise in the world on the types of loopholes that could be taken advantage of in order um, to come up with a zero sum or a very low number um, in paying your taxes, which is really unfortunate. Um, I think that this comes down to, you know, do you believe that the President of the United States, the number one global economy, number two is China, number three is Japan, number four, I'm so proud to say, is my home state of California, that if the President of the United States, who has war powers, who has the codes to our nuclear weapons, should not have to disclose where his money is being earned from, or collected from. You know, I, I think that that is what we are trying to do here, is to provide a system of checks and balance um, for the general public, the law-abiding public that, you know, goes to a neighborhood tax ac accountant and, you know, discloses all of their incomes and provides, you know, their information and pay, ultimately pays their taxes, someone who's not looking for loopholes um, to get out of paying their taxes. Um, so I'm delighted to have you here. I'm um, very proud to support this bill. Um, I hope that the Senate will take it up before leaving, and I hope that the, the president will sign it, because I think that this only advances um, democracy. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Fishback. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I Given the fact that there was no markup, there's been uh, very little, uh, there's, n and if I'm understanding uh, Mr. Smith correctly, there was nothing in committee um, that was done on this bill. It, it, it really, truly is obvious that this is 100% political. And um, there's something I did want to just uh, clear up, and I want to ask Mr. Smith. Uh, there is the, a presidential candidate does a financial disclosure similar to what we do, similar to what, when you run for Congress. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. So there is disclosure. I mean, there's, they are giving information about where their money is coming from, how much. It's just not their taxes. But, but as I recall, um, you know, filling those out, there's a lot of information available once you fill that out that you are putting in there, the values of your properties. I mean, it's a range, but, you know, values. So, so that seems like there is, so there is disclosure. So they are doing something now. Just want to make that clear because... It, it, the discussion that's been going on uh, makes it sound like there's no disclosure at all currently. 
and that this is absolutely necessary so that we could find out those things, which it isn't. Um, but given that, uh, you know, the timing, two weeks before we're done, maybe not a week and a half, maybe it's now. I don't know. <laughs> but um, um, I hope in a couple of days. A couple of days. Well, <laughs> end of the year, you know, I mean, is a week and a half, and, and that the process has been so um, just any kind of input. Um, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Smith, if you have any, uh, since you had no opportunity to have the discussion about what, what may be the improvements that you can make, did you have any thoughts on improvements that potentially to the bill that you could have made if given the opportunity to have any discussion on it? Well, I, I really believe this is, this is an issue, a topic, an endeavor that we could work together on. And, you know, as we're seeing, power can shift here uh, rel relatively quickly. And I think it, it is in all of our interest to have a process so that we're not left to looking, to looking for political leverage to disclose private information. That, that is, and especially if um, there's information, you know, personal identifying information, especially of minor children. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just think that <laughs> the process clearly is showing that it needs improvement. Whether you want to mandate it by law or not, there, there's a lot of room for improvement. Releasing private information is entirely unnecessary uh, for, this, for this endeavor. So, you know, I, I think that uh, overall, uh, we, we could come up with some, some language uh, looking at, you know, various amendments uh, of who would qualify, uh, who should qualify for uh, um, uh, these types of reviews and disclosure, uh, family members and such. I mean, it, it, but we, we want to be prescriptive on this and, and diligent uh, all, all at the same time. Well, it, it is just sad that the opportunity was never given to have those discussions, to offer amendments, to, to go through the process of putting together a bill. And I think that just is, is it makes it very, very obvious that all this is, is political. This is 100% political. It's being rammed through in the last few days. Uh, I'll give you the few days, and that's unfortunate. Um, but thank you for being here both. Thank you. And yeah, I yield back. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm just confused why, why everybody's so upset uh, on the Republican side, so upset about this. The only person that this bill would audit is Joe Biden. Um, un unless when you guys come into uh, power in January that you're going to again vote to nullify the 2020 election and put <laughs> Trump in. I mean, but the only person this, hey, this would audit is, is Joe Biden. But anyway, maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> Mr. Perlmutter. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. I guess, Mr. Smith, I'm, I'm bewildered by your argument because the President of the United States is anything but a private citizen, period. And the last President, the ex-President, Donald Trump, never wants to be a private citizen. He wants to be in the public eye. His finances have always been a matter of question. Six of his companies filed bankruptcy. Okay, there's always been an issue around this. And for all of you, I, I guess I'd ask both of you, how many times, how many appeals did Donald Trump take on releasing his taxes, tax returns? I would say he went up and down to the Supreme Court three times on this subject. So for my friend, Ms. Fishbach, to say, oh, you guys have delayed, why are you doing this at the end of the session and all that stuff, baloney, this is four years of dilatory tactics by the ex-president. And, you know, it may be that only Joe Biden, on a going forward basis, is the person who can have his taxes audited. But I'll tell you, the reason is because of the, the steps that were taken by the ex-president. So, Ms. Chu, I don't know if you know how many appeals were taken to delay this thing. I know your committee started asking for this a long time ago. Chairman Neal asked for these returns four years ago, and indeed there were numerous delays to getting them. It wasn't until um, November, I mean, that, that we actually got them and found out how, uh, how derelict the IRS was in actually conducting the mandatory presidential audits. So what this is about is about the office of the presidency. It's not about one president. I really want to emphasize this. It's about how the presidency 
is, um, is given transparency. And with this audit, we will be able to see if the president is indeed conducting his or her business in the proper manner with regard to their finances. And it would be for this president and all future presidents. The American public has the right to know. Mr. Smith. I, I think, Mr. Perlmutter, you, you articulated very clearly this. You're saying that this is about President Trump. The chairman says, no, it's about Joe Biden. My concern is that for, for the time frame that you mentioned uh, of all of the appeals and so forth, only this week marks the beginning of a legislative proposal. It could have started a long time ago and even in an effort to bring us together. All right, that's a fair response. That is a fair response. But the problem here is, and the only reason we're doing this, is because of four years of refusal to follow any tradition that has been uh, brought by presidents of releasing their tax returns. And the question was, what does the ex-president have to hide? Well, you're right. On a going forward basis, this will affect other presidents, not him. We had to go through 49 subpoenas to be able to get these returns that other presidents, Democrats and Republicans, had released on their own. But not this, not that one. So, but, but understand that the tradition of releasing well, tradition taxes is not the law. Is before the election, sure. and the voters ultimately decide. The tradition is not the law. Well, we're apparently prepared to change the law to meet the tradition that President Trump was not prepared to follow. So I'm going to yield back to the chair. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, but Ms. Chu, thank you for bringing this to us, and I want to make sure I, I've got this right. This legislation will apply only to presidents going forward. It doesn't apply to former presidents, does it? That is correct. Okay. Um, and so Donald Trump, he was able to get away with not having his tax returns released while he was president. He already was able to make that happen. So this is about saying, going forward, we want to make sure that those presidential returns are available for the public to see, right? Right. OK. Now, I want to go back to uh, something I think that the ranking member said um, about, well, why would this apply just to the president, not to the Speaker of the House, not to the Senate Majority Leader, and so on, which is a fair question. Um, and I want to try to tease this out, um, because um, I would think the president is in a unique posture. Uh, the president sits on top of the entire executive branch of government, including the Department of Treasury, which includes the Internal Revenue Service. And according to uh, at least one theory, which is very popular, certainly in conservative circles, there is a unitary executive, meaning everybody in the executive branch reports all the way up to the president. And the president decides everything that goes on and is responsible for everything that goes on below him or below her. Um, in that case, that means that the Internal Revenue Service is vertically obedient and responsive to the president of the United States. Have there not been presidents, like Richard Nixon is one who comes to mind immediately, who have used their power over the Treasury Department and the IRS in order to uh, persecute political enemies, people on their enemies list, to say, we're going to audit your returns, we're going to go after you? Isn't that part of the history of the presidency? Yes. Um, OK. so. This legislation is saying that the president himself or herself, who has this power over the whole executive branch of government, must be subject to it as the person who ultimately has to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. Now, I would add something else. Under Article 1, Section 9, Clause 8 of the Constitution, the president is restricted, like other federal office holders is, in not being able to take presents, offices, emoluments, and titles from foreign governments. Isn't that right? And this is a president that were, the last president was one who started off in office by saying he was not going to stop being in business. He was going to continue being 
in more than 200 different businesses he has all over the world. Hotels, golf courses, licensing deals, you name it. Okay, don't the people of the United States who employ all of us, don't the people of the United States have an interest in making sure that the President of the United States is not violating the Foreign Emoluments Clause or the Domestic Emoluments Clause, uh, for that matter, by engaging in business and receiving income from foreign uh, government sources, or as the Constitution puts it, princes, kings, foreign states, without the consent of Congress. Don't we have that interest? Well, I, it, this strikes me as an obvious thing to do, as the right thing to do. Um, I'm uh, sorry it had to come to Congress legislating in order to make it happen, because presidents up until this point had respected the tradition of just opening up uh, their tax returns, but certainly it's the right thing to do. And it seems to me odd that in a fit of pique about whatever imagined transgressions poor Donald Trump has suffered, we would frustrate ourselves going forward in terms of defining the law in such a way that makes sense within our constitutional system. I want to thank you and all the members of the Ways and Means Committee for the work you've done on it. Yeah, Mr. Smith, please. May I suggest that the IRS has immense power to audit and to make and draw conclusions from audits and refer to the DOJ if necessary. <laughs> I mean, does the IRS have the power to audit the president if the president says, don't audit me? The IRS still has the power to audit. Really? Even if the president says no? Because isn't the whole theory of the unitary executive that the president controls all executive department functions underneath him? Well, the IRS commissioner serves in a, in a different uh, time frame and, okay. and so forth. And so you're, you understand other, you're breaking from conservative orthodoxy there, which says that the president is ultimately in control of everything that happens in the executive branch. Well, there, there is a process that, that has traditionally been taking place that I think um, we want to take a look at. And, and again, we could come up together with a process that I think would be far more responsible than jamming this through uh, a last minute all because uh, of one taxpayer well, who was president. Do you have a substantive problem with this legislation? Because I haven't really heard a substantive criticism. There, there are concerns about uh, the language and, and uh, the, I mean, the very fact that it hasn't been vetted because yesterday's markup was really more about okay. a release of private information. Than well, here, you know, I, I think Mr. Perlmutter may have conceded too much when he said you had a fair point about why not raise the legislation in advance. They couldn't write the legislation in advance because they didn't know whether or not the current process was working. It wasn't until this was finally released after all the adjudication that they learned, as I understand, that the IRS was not conducting the presidential audits that they were supposed to do under the handbook. Is that right, Ms. Drew? That is absolutely correct. You didn't know that before. Right. I mean, for all you knew, the, the system was working perfectly and there was no problem, but they didn't know that until they conducted all the adjudication. So it seems to me that, uh, in fact, you have very little problem with the substance of the legislation, but everybody, again, is still scrambling around to show uh, the former president that nobody is going to, uh, you know, step on his toes in any way. And I, I think that that's, you know, an unfortunate thing, but we may just have to disagree about that. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Uh, no, we did, yeah, yeah, Mr. Morelli. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I, I will try not to uh, go over ground that's been covered, but I, I, I am mystified by this. As I, I think I've said before, as we have done things like the Electoral Count Act and other things that have come before us, and the complaint is always you're doing this because of the former president. But the problem is, as I think Mr. Raskin points out, the former president broke so many norms and did things in such extraordinary and extreme ways that we're forced to continue to try to come to terms with the anomaly that's the Trump presidency. I mean, continuing to do business from the White House, from the Oval Office, as part of the Trump Organization, is unprecedented in, certainly in modern history, I'd almost argue it's unprecedented anywhere in American history. The Emoluments Clause um, and the question of whether or not that's been broken, which Mr. Raskin raises, is a serious question. Um, and I, what I fear, and I think we fear, is that normalizing extreme behavior changes the nature of what we've done as a republic for the last two and a half centuries. You know, the question of whether you have a peaceful transfer of power, that was disrupted in ways that are still, to me, unimaginable. And 
uh, the things that we have had to contend with that no president of either party, of any party, ever did, to me, is just so extraordinary. And, you know, when you look at, at, at not only, and I, I think, too, my colleagues have described why the presidency is different than being, no disrespect to the majority leader of the House or the president pro tem of the Senate, um, doesn't have the breadth and the depth of power that we have vested in one individual in the executive branch in the White House. So this is different. I don't think any person watching this would doubt for a moment the difference between the President of the United States and literally any other officer of the, uh, of the, of, of the U.S. government. And so it is different. And, you know, the failure to conduct audits by the IRS, even though they have a mandate to do it, um, is troubling. I, I thought I read this morning one of the accounts, the former IRS commissioner appointed by President Trump during his term saying, I don't understand how this could have happened and you need to investigate why this didn't happen. Say, that, that's a, that, that was a, a former IRS uh, commissioner saying that. You know, by design, uh, there were efforts time and time and time again to prevent uh, the release of the information, to prevent anything that would amount to any disclosure. And this is at a time when the former president's organization continues to be investigated, was convicted by a jury in New York of having the Trump organization of violating the law, criminal conduct by an organization that we know the president, the former president, uh, literally micromanages. Um, and so there, th this is just, the norms have been destroyed. And frankly, I don't disagree with Mr. Cole and others uh, who I have enormous respect for. This isn't the process any of us would like. It's the last thing we would like to do. Problem is, respectfully, I haven't heard a single Republican say that in the new majority they would continue to make sure that there's accountability. In fact, I think the reason we're here at the 11th hour, I think is, is clear that there will be every effort made to uh, make sure that there is no accountability. And frankly, the delay after delay after delay could have been answered. Um, but we had to go to court. We went to the Supreme Court of the United States uh, to be able to get this information for the committee. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing. So, you know, I, I'm reminded, I think it's President Lincoln uh, defined a hypocrite as uh, the man who murders his parents and pleaded for mercy on the grounds he was an orphan. I mean, we've delayed, we've delayed, we've delayed. You've given us literally no choice, literally no opportunity to do anything. And so here we are at the 11th hour, and I agree. Uh, uh, frankly, I wish I believed there was more uh, good faith effort that we could have a deal. And honestly, in a few weeks, we'll be able to have that opportunity. We'll see uh, what the new majority does as it relates to safeguarding the interests of the American public. That's what this really is. I don't really care about uh, Donald Trump or his business interests or what his wealth is or anything else personally, except he's not, a, he's not a private citizen. He's already announced for the presidency. He is a public figure, has been, and will continue to be. So... Um, I don't want to belabor it. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity, Mr. Sp Mr. Chair, to uh, to comment on it. I, I certainly appreciate uh, the gentlelady for coming here, and uh, I'll uh, support the rule and the underlying bill. And I yield back. Anybody else have any questions? You all said, Mr. Desanye, or, or Ms. Ross is okay? What? Yes, sir. Desanye, you just, have a, just a comment, Mr. Chair. You're good? Okay. I'm good if you're good. All right. All right. So, we good. Yeah, so there's no other questions. I think, I, I would, yeah, absolutely. I mean, to, it's been expressed that the only way to come up with this legislation was to obtain and release to the public private taxpayer information. No. This effort could have been begun a long time ago and gotten updates from the IRS and, and having an exchange uh, of what can and should, can or should take place in order to arrive at legislation uh, to move forward, but uh, please know that there's nothing in the bill that actually addresses the former president's no. scenario. Right, but with respect, many of us thought that there was an ongoing audit. Like, yeah. we, we, we just assumed that was happening. And so what is really quite, um, you know, stunning to me is that this was not happening on a yearly basis. And, and perhaps we should be more prescriptive in uh, the money we hand over to the IRS. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know what? Well, I don't want to go. I, we, I don't want to go. I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just so tired of kind of the circling the wagons around behavior that has been unacceptable. Um, and what we should be doing is trying to find a way forward so that all the things that I think all of us should agree 
is, has been inappropriate never happens again, whether it's a Republican president or a Democratic president. I think that's what this is trying to do. So, oh, and yeah, so there's no other questions. You are free to go. Thank you. Are there any members who wish to testify in H.R. 9460? Seeing none, this closes the hearing on H.R. 9460. Uh, at this time, the Chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentleman from California, Mr. Torres. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 9640, the Presidential Tax Filings and Audit Transparency Act of 2022, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on ways and means or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides one for consideration of S-1942, the National Heritage Area Act, under a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Natural Resources or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule provides one motion to recommit, and the rule provides that House Resolution 693 is hereby adopted. The rule provides that House Resolution 1434 is hereby adopted. The rule provides that at any time through the legislative day of December 23rd, 2022, the Speaker may entertain motions offered by the Majority Leader or a designee that the House suspend the rules with respect to multiple measures that were the object of motions to suspend the rules on the legislative day of December 21, December 22, December 23, 2022 on which the yeas and nays were order and further proceedings postponed. The chair shall put the question on, on any such motion without debate or intervening motion and the ordering of the yeas and nays on postponed motions to suspend the rules with respect to such measures is vacated. Section 6 of the rule provides that on any legislative day of the second session on the 117th Congress after December 22, 2022, the journal of the proceedings of the previous day shall be considered as approved. Finally, for the duration of the period addressed by Section 6, the Speaker may appoint members to perform the duties of the chair, and each day shall not constitute a calendar day for the purpose of Section 7, of the War Powers Resolution, a re legislative day for purposes of Clause 7 of Rule 13, or a calendar day, or a calendar or legislative day for purposes of Clause 7 C1 of Rule 22. I heard the motion from the gentleman from California. Is there any debate or amendments? Or hearing none, the vote is on the uh, motion from the gentleman from California. All those in favor, say aye. 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 No. 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 Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. That would request recorded vote. Recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Promutter. Mr. Promutter. Mr. Promutter. Pass. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Morelli? Aye. Mr. Morelli, aye. Mr. Desonier? Aye. Mr. Desonier, aye. Ms. Ross? Aye. Ms. Ross, aye. Mr. Nagus? Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Burgess? Mr. Reschenthaler? No. Mrs. Fishbach? No. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Promutter is not recorded. Mr. Promutter, aye. Uh, clerk, uh, clerk, report the total. Eight, eight yeas, three nays. And the motion is agreed to, and I will handle it for us. And Ms. Fishbach will handle it for the Republicans. And so I think the plan is to get this uh, debate done. Before
before the President Zelensky's speech. Before. So, not the vote, but the, the debate. Yeah, so, but we will, we'll, uh, we'll call you as soon as we get, yeah, we're still doing suspension. So, so we'll give you a, as soon as we know. Maybe earlier. All right, thank you. Uh, so without objection, the committee is adjourned.